Patch Patch. Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. All right, welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee Wan, and with me as always via the Skype out in Nassau County, it's the birthday boy. It's John. John, happy birthday. Thanks. I guess my gift to you is a podcast dedicated to your favorite, least favorite, <laughs> a song of Ice my and favorite, Fire character. My favorite character, Tate. Yeah, yeah. Your hatred for Catelyn Stark versus your love for Jon Snow, which would you say is more powerful? Um... Uh... Jon Snow. Yeah. I, I thought you would say that, but I just wanted to make sure. That- I wouldn't be getting any, like, anti cat telly tattoos on me or something. Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this right here is a back, is an upside down fish with a, you know, with a knife to the freaking gullet. <laughs> this is a tattoo of Black Walder. It's my favorite character. <laughs> oh, boy. Today we're going to get into the A Song of Ice and Fire generation of Tullys. The Tullys that we know the best. So we're not going to be talking about your Kermit Tullys or your Elmo Tullys or your Grover Tullys. <laughs> that's, that's horrible. I'm still, I still can't get over that. That is just like so horrible. Yeah. It's I mean, bad. shit. I mean, that's, I mean, that really is just, I mean, such bad, immature writing. It really is. He completely ran out of ideas. Yeah. He couldn't possibly think of any more names whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. It was Kermit. Kermit wasn't Gro- the, I think it was Grover was the grandfather and then Kermit was his son, and then Elmo right, was his Grover, son. I can, okay, Grover, okay, I can kind of let that pass a little bit. You know, Grover, and House Glover a little bit, you know, the, the, you know it kind of can kind of... But when you throw in Kermit in there, that, that's it, done. Yeah, it's, done. Too, it's way too on the nose. I mean, you could put Kermit if, like, it's just Kermit. I think any one of those names will work if it's just one name. No, I'm sorry, okay. Yeah, yeah, Grover Tully was aged, his grandson Elmo... And his great grandson Kermit. I don't remember looking at the Tully family tree for Grover Tully, but I can imagine his son is probably another Sesame Street or Muppet <laughs> name. Gonzo. Yeah, Gonzo Tully. <laughs> uh, it fits though. If, the, if there's one family that it fits with, it's the Tullys of River Run. So, moving along through the history of the Riverlands and Catching up with the generation of Tullys that we know best, John of the Tullys that we meet throughout A Song of Ice and Fire, which Tully is your favorite? I got in my head, it's the Blackfish. But you don't seem like you're too high on him. He's kind of like lukewarm water, you know, not too high, not too cold, but you know. Now, is he lukewarm, <laughs> is he lukewarm water because he's a Tully? Yeah, it just drains him. It just, okay. it, I do like him. I, I mean, he is the only, like, respectable Tully. Although, again, we've talked about before, Houster Tully has had to had right. be some sort of a respectful, honor, you know, type of guy. But the, his children are just so goddamn... Disaster. I mean, yeah. Disaster. God, horrible. I mean, they, those kids must have been dropped down the stairs, okay? Quite a few times. Well, you talk about the Tully funeral traditions where you <laughs> put the dead body in a boat, send it down the river, and, and you try to light it to flame with with a flaming arrow, there's also the Tully birthing traditions where you take the child and you just toss him down a couple <laughs> flights of stairs. <laughs> That's horrible. Uh, they throw him in the water to come back yeah, out. Right. You dunk him in the water. <laughs> it's great. It's kind of like a great joy thing. No, trust me, it works. <laughs> the great joys do this all the time. It works. Yeah. <laughs> all those guys are sane and completely, you know, mental, their mental stability is perfect. We should be more like the Greyjoys. You know the Greyjoys built Harrenhal, right? <laughs> yeah, they built it. Okay. <laughs> they never really lived in it. <laughs> All right. So this section, Hoster Tully and the a Song of Ice and Fire generation of Tullys. The basics of Hoster Tully. He is described mostly by Catelyn. Most of the information we get about Hoster Tully is the Catelyn Stark POVs. And Hoster is described as tall and broad. Strong, blue eyes, brown hair. Does that sound like any of the Stark kids to you? Rob. 
Yeah, probably robbed the most, right? Yeah. Hoster has silver plate and mail armor. His cloak and surcoat are blue and red, just like the house colors of House Tully. His shield was massive. It was made of oak and iron. He owned a hunting horn, and he rode a brown gelding. All information we get from Catelyn. He had always been a proud man. He could never sit still, and he was often traveling, which is something I want to come back to later, unless you have something to say. Can I add something, please? Absolutely. I think we have to put an asterisk over all this, because if it's coming from Catelyn, right. I'm not sure how reliable this can be. For all we know, there may have been no hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> she can make the whole thing up. <laughs> Though he could never sit still. He was often traveling in his older years, unable to travel. He would enjoy watching the Red Fork and the Tumblestone from his solar in the Keep of River Run. And we're not exactly sure when he became Lord of River Run. But the best estimate, it was at some point during 264 AC, upon the death of his father, and his father's name is not canon, which is kind of weird that you get a Kermit, Elmo, and well, it's, Grover, it's but you don't get Hoster's father's name. Exactly. And that, that's a lot of thing, and a lot of the stuff with George R. R. Martin, and he's written so much about this, but he just leaves off so many considerable names that right. probably should be a little bit more known. If there's not a name for someone who, like, the, the great, 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 great uncle, okay, fine, but uh, a father or a grandfather of, of these recent characters are just, like, left, like, well, you know, I've decided I just, you know, can make your own name up for him. I really don't care. <laughs> Figure it out. Go to Westeros. Talk to Elio. He knows. Elio always knows. I'm sure I put it somewhere. I gotta write another book out, I guess. <laughs> this character was a lord of River Run. You know what I mean? It's not just... Yeah. Somebody's father is the Lord of the River Run. Right. You'd think there would be some sort of family tree going on here. But there's yeah. so many times that George is right, he just forgets, like, you know, like, born in 260 or 261. Like, it's like, like. Oh, bro, this, I got some I got some years discrepancies for you coming up in just a moment. So. Really? Oh, okay, here we go. This is, this is going to be the highlight of this, this episode. Oh, Jesus, this is dude. talking about the years. Yeah, I got, I, got, I got some good ones coming for you. Well, speaking of Tully funeral customs, they involve the body of a deceased being placed in a boat and sent down the Red Fork of the Trident and set aflame by a fire arrow shot by the Lord of River Run. During his father's funeral, his unnamed father's funeral, Hoster missed his first shot, but found his father's body with the second arrow, which is somewhat a precursor, yeah, a precursor to what happens with Edmure, though Edmure, what, misses like three or four shots. It was getting to the point where like, hit, hit the Blackfish didn't get in there, it would have been like, <laughs> oh crap, oh, this, this yeah. family is cursed. Well, I mean, considering everything that happens, maybe they would have been better off not lighting Hoster Tully on fire. All right, so John, are, are Tully funeral customs, are they interesting or are they dumb? I think they're kind of interesting. Can they be both? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's kind of dumb. Like, we're just going to throw in a river and we're, you know, I mean, and play a game, you know. As we just said, you know, you, we can miss and not get this done right. I mean. Yeah. Like, who's the first asshole that was like, all right, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been Kermit. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, boy. Put him in the boat and send him down the river. Wait, what if we light him on fire? Yeah, let's light him on fire. How about this? How about you got to shoot an arrow and get him on fire in the boat? You got to wait till he's 10 10 meters into the ocean. 10 laps. There's a referee on site to make sure that you... (laughs) No, illegal arrow. That doesn't count. Bring him back. Put out the fire. Okay, we're going to jump around a little bit here because... We just said that Hoster Tully became the Lord of River Run at some point during 264 AC is the best estimate. So to back up a little bit before he becomes Lord of River Run, Hoster Tully married Lady Minissa Hwent of Harrenhal. And he married her while his father ruled the Riverlands. He married her before the War of the Nine Penny Kings. Together, Hoster and his wife Minissa had three children, though there were three more that did not survive past infancy. And the timing isn't very clear as to if... I hate to see that, but geez, I wish, uh, <laughs> wish been 3 plus 3 there. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I'm okay with Edmure. I know you don't... Uh, dude, I'm going to be starting with Edmure. Although, you know what, dude? If, it was, if there was no Catelyn and Lysa, I'm sure Edmure would have found a way to fucking... You know. <laughs> well, he they, all, they all really contributed to the, the full of House Stark in so yeah. much way. Yeah. <laughs> so around that, around that way. All right, so the timing isn't very clear as to if Catelyn was born before the death of her two brothers, but it seems unlikely that she was born before they died. It was more likely that two sons were born to Hoster and Minissa. Both sons did not survive past infancy, and then Catelyn was born. 
it is clear that Lady Minissa. Damn it. <laughs> it's clear that. <laughs> Damn. Damn you, Fate. It's clear that Lady Minissa bore Hoster two sons that did not survive, and therefore Hoster came to regard Catelyn as his heir. Another daughter followed Catelyn, Lysa, <laughs> another what? winner. And then finally a son. You sure yeah. say that again. You know what, dude? Looking at some of this stuff, I mean, I know, you know, Catelyn does like the big fucking bonehead moves, but Lysa's got some fucking doozies herself. Oh, yeah. Jeez, forget about it. She's definitely up there also. It's a, it's a tag team. Well, it that's really the thing, because without, without some of the things that <laughs> Lysa did... Catelyn doesn't do some of the things. It is a, a true Tully team effort. Yeah. And the strings being pulled, obviously, by Littlefinger. Yes. Absolutely. Littlefinger is right in there with it. Because he knows exactly what to do and what to say. It does seem like, it does seem like he, he had it planned from a young age. And yeah. we're going to get to the point in time where it seems like he started to manipulate House Tully. After Lysa, finally a son is born to Minissa and Hoster, Edmure. Lady Minissa bore another son after Edmure, but she did not survive that childbirth and the son died along with her. As reflected upon by Catelyn in her own POVs, Hoster Tully truly loved his wife and was deeply scarred and saddened by her death, missing her and just as sad decades later. Let's see. I already lost two sons. Three. Got yeah. two daughters. Another son. Let's just keep on going. <laughs> How much more she have in her? Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that Minnesota Tully is described as, as frail. So six childbirths, whether the children live or not, that's, that's going to do a number on her. I'm surprised she... She birthed that many children. Yeah, the mason comes back home, so I think you should kind of stop. Yeah. <laughs> Did you pull out? God no damn. way. <laughs> no way. I'm on the Lord of River Run here. Hey, we flow like a river. Right, Ed Muir? Right, Dad. <laughs> so here's the official Elio timeline for this generation of House Tully. I mean, it's got to be Elio because we can't expect George to do any kind of timeline on this. Nah. Do you think that Elio gets paid by George? Like, yes. Yes. He's got to get some sort of royalty in there or something. Yeah. He's got to be on the, on the George Martin payroll. Hoster Tully, born between 238 and 240 AC. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Oh, dude, dude please. How the hell can that be any bit of a direct? It's like George Canty, born between 1978 and 1980. That yeah. really limits it. <laughs> Nobody knows. Minissa went. All we have on her is she's born no later than 250 AC. So it's so bad. It could it's be it could so be 190 bad. AC. She might have been 80 when she married Hoster. Who knows? Dead Tully male number one. Born and died before 264 AC. Dead Tully male number two. Born and died before 264 AC. Catelyn Tully born in 264 or 265 AC. Lysa Tully born between 266 and 268 AC. Okay. Here's the one that's just like, Edmure Tully, born between 267 and 274 AC. Like, what? <laughs> like, come on. So, like, is he 30 or is he 40? What the fuck? He could be 23. Who knows? He could be 30. We don't know. He's just there. He's immortal. Uh, dead Tully male number three. <laughs> Born and died between 268 and 278 AC. Like, what? Oh, God. Horrible. Like, do you think Elio calls up George and says, listen, can I get a timeline on this? Yeah, Elio, you just put down whatever you feel like. <laughs> whatever. Oh. <laughs> I'm, doing a, I'm doing a wild card marathon right now. Uh, uh, as of 264 AC, when Hoster Tully is the Lord of River Run. He is married to Minnesota Went for a few years, and his two sons have died as infants. So it is quite possible that Catelyn has been born and is herself an infant, or at the very least, Lady Minnesota is pregnant with Catelyn in 264 AC. In all seriousness, what kind of effect would the death of two sons have on Hoster when Catelyn is then the first child that survives infancy? I would think he'd be more protective of her, mm -hmm. you know, appreciative of her. Well... I think, let, let, but I think as evidence of his protection, maybe specifically, you know, when his second child, Lysa, is born, mm -hmm. and we just kind of fast track it a little. I don't want to fast track it, but you know, just skip ahead, just you know, momentarily. When Little Fear gets involved, mm -hmm. he and we, we, you know, that Lysa and Little Fear went at, you know, had you know a, a, a rendezvous, uh, and uh, she got pregnant by Littlefinger. Yeah, that he immediately got him and aborted the kid. 
and that was it. Like, you know, he was didn't think that Littlefinger was suitable right. to be going with one of his daughters. Right. The whole Littlefinger, like you said, we will get to that, but the whole Peter Baelish situation is somewhat mind-boggling. And while I was reading about this stuff, I'm like, is George just making, like, is he just connecting dots for the sake of the narrative of A Song of Ice and Fire? And we'll get to it. You'll see what I mean. But it's it's mind-boggling that Peter Baelish was a ward at River Run. I just don't understand it. Hoster becomes Lord of River Run in 264 AC, and his first moves was to secure alliances. And last episode, we talked about House Tully's survival and their success throughout history, and the key to their survival, the key to their success and rising to Lords Paramount of the Riverlands was the political practice of having strong alliances. And every house needs to have strong alliances, but it seems like the Tullys are always able or were always able to leverage new alliances into safety, security, and success. So Haas is going to continue this political practice of seeking out and securing new alliances. So your Haas to Tully, it's 264. You lost two sons. You have a baby girl or your wife is just about to give birth to another baby who ends up being a girl. Hoster's heir is, at this time, his brother, Brendan Tully. So for a marriage alliance, his only option is his brother. And he actually, it's, it's an interesting alliance that he had secured. It's with House Redwine and Lady Bethany Redwine, Lords of the Arbor, Arbor Reds. House Redwine is a, it's a wealthy house. They're not the overlords of their region. They're probably not even in the top three houses of the Reach in power, although they are wealthy and they do, I believe at this time, they do have the best Navy. They are the biggest naval power in Westeros at this point in time. If not, they're, they're right there and they do become the greatest naval power in Westeros at some point during A Song of Ice and Fire then, but I, I believe it's at this, this time that they, that they have the strongest Navy. So it's an interesting alliance and Hoster agreed to it. Lady Bethany Redwine's father agreed to it, but Brynden... Tully would have nothing to do with the marriage. And this was the beginning of a long feud between the two brothers. It seems like this was the moment where everything fractured for them and Mm -hmm. and they never recovered. Brynden Tully is younger than Hoster by five years. They were close through their childhood. And thinking about that five-year age difference, I can't help but think of my own brothers and my relationships with them. My brother Patrick is closer in my age, less than two years. So he was, you know, growing up, he was always more of a peer, whereas Daniel was younger than me by, I think it was more than five years, right? Yeah, way more. Actually, more than five. He was a good seven or eight, maybe more than that. Well, he was, I, I can't even do the fucking math, but. I always forgot. I always forgot Dan, Dan was young enough that Canteen could fucking powerbomb him when we were in like 11th and 12th grade, so. Now the, now the, oh. now the tales are reversed where he did yeah, way reversed, dude. He could do like a Roman Reigns <laughs> double powerbomb on us, probably. <laughs> Tough to tough up getting me getting off me. You know, you'd be no problem. Getting me up might be a little, I think be a little tough. I think, I think you could get Well, actually, maybe not. A couple of years ago, he could have. But yeah, I mean, he, he's, he's significantly younger than me. So while I was close with him and now as adults, obviously, I consider him a peer. But when I was a young adult, he was a kid. You know, and in that phase of our relationship, obviously, I felt like I knew more than him. I knew better than him. So I would think that Hoster Tully... Looking at his brother Brendan, though they got along as children, Hoster was older and now he's the Lord. He probably just thought he knew what was best for House Tully and he knew what was best for his brother Brendan. And what it comes down to is it doesn't seem that Hoster asked for Brendan's opinion on the matter before he sought out the marriage pact with the Red Wines. Well, I can't get over my head right now. And I might go a little bit off topic. And forgive me. That's quite right. We're talking about, you know, the Blackfish and Hosea Tully, I just, I just can't get my mind over in a, uh, a spew with this guy on YouTube who's saying to me that, uh, you know, this is done because there are rumors that the Blackfish right. is gay. Yes. And that that's one of the reasons why he didn't want to get married. Yes. But another reason for the Blackfish and Hosea Tully being at, at, uh, at odds over this. At odds is because Hosea Tully how'd it go? He was saying something about Eddard and how he forced Eddard to take Catelyn? To continually take Catelyn's hand or else. And it had something to do with John not being, you know, not being 
RLJ also. I forget how it got how that got all implanted. So and and that's the reason why that you know that the Blackfish stormed off because of what he was doing with Edart. I said, okay, well you know I don't recall that in the books. Can you please send me you know give the me page you know, number, the <laughs> something chapter, the page number, something so I can read that. Maybe I yeah. maybe I missed that. After going back and forth quite a few times, and him being so like headstrong, and then he also he flipped out. Well, that's where I just think what happens. Oh, it's what you think <laughs> what happens, not actually what happens. Yeah, you're just now just you know so you're just making shit up. <laughs> yeah, you're making it up because you just want it to happen. Okay, now, there's a difference from it actually being right. said in the books than in actually yeah. and what you're just saying. Yeah, you you want the Harry Potter fucking conspiracy rooms? Oh, it's just what I think happens sometimes. About the red wine, real quick, it's, it's unknown what Bethany Redwine's direct relationship to the main branch of House Redwine is. She is a noble lady of a powerful house in another region of Westeros. As it happens, Bethany Redwine ends up marrying Mathis Rowan. I don't know if you remember Mathis Rowan. He's talked about a bit in A Clash of Kings. He's with the Renly camp, but he does show up in A Feast for Crows. He is the lord of Golden Grove. Golden Grove, like the arbor. They're both located in the southwest area of the Reach, very far from the Riverlands. And it is common knowledge that the great houses abide by the practice of marrying with vassal houses to keep their alliances strong, thus consolidating their power within the region. I got to think that this practice originates from the time of uh, seven separate kingdoms, but it was almost like the southern ambitions, the alliance of great houses. It's hinted at a little bit here, and, and Hoster's very forward thinking in what he's trying to do. So I can understand his disappointment in his brother because he probably looks at this marriage and he's like, nice. You know, this is a very wealthy house, a naval power, a secure alliance with a powerful house in another region of Westeros. And Brendan's just like, like he doesn't ask me. He just, like he thinks he could just marry me off. You know, fuck that. Brendan and Hoster are, as far as we know from canon, the only children of their unnamed father and mother. And it can't be said if they had any other siblings that died before their time. It just seems like it was the two of them. Brendan Tully and Norbert Vance, who would go on to become the Lord of Atranta, the seat of House Vance, they squired together for Lord Darry. And I'm not sure if, I'm not sure exactly who this Darry was, because the Darry family tree is also non canon Well, <laughs> that's not surprising. Yeah, it's not information. It's like for every, it's like for every obscure bit of information that he comes up with, He's got one missing for something equally as important. Right. Yeah. He goes in so in-depth on one thing. You're like, wow, oh. my God, that's so in-depth. And then we have a birthday between 278 and 274. What's the deal with Ned's mom? I don't know. Who knows? Um, Brendan and Norbert would have a good relationship through their adulthood. In 260 AC, Brendan fought alongside his brother in the War of the Nine Penny Kings, which we have spoken about. Not super in depth, but we, during our Robert's Rebellion War of the Usurper series, they fought against the Band of Nine on the Stepstones. Brynden, during this war, he proved himself a great and a worthy knight, and his prowess on the battlefield earned him renown throughout the Seven Kingdoms. So this war made Brynden Tully famous throughout the realm, and he's probably one of the more popular supporting characters in A Song of Ice and Fire. But there is a like a small contingency of the fandom that actually dislikes Brendan Tully. And they view his his refusal to marry, to shore up alliances for his house, his quick dismissal of Ed Muir Tully's life later on in A Feast for Crows, and his refusal to yield River Run, thus putting all of the people in River Run in, in danger of their lives, not to mention the way he really scoured the earth um, and dismissed useless mouths from the castle before the Frey host descended on River Run. They look at those actions as selfish and a little bit out of touch. I asked you this before about your feelings on Brendan Tully. Those things that some people say are selfish, I actually think that they're, if you're at war, those are the smart moves to make. I don't know what your feelings are, but if he doesn't want to marry somebody, he doesn't want to marry somebody. Edmure Tully, he says, kill him or, or, or not, but be done with him. I'm sure Edmure's just as tired of, of uh, you know, going up to the hangman's noose. I'm totally paraphrasing. But, you know, he's like, so just kill Edmure. Like, he's a dead man anyway. Just kill him. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that makes sense to me, right? 
I mean, the situation jumping forward this much in Feast for Crows is when they they keep bringing him up to the he, they keep making like he, they're going to hang him and they're like give us River Run or we're going to hang your lord. I'm, I'm not going to give a River Run because you're you're you're, right. you're bringing me my nephew here as you know no matter what if I give it up you're still going to kill him you're going to kill both of us so anyways regardless we're both dead if I you know the better chance of living if you just kill him there and I hold the castle yeah if you're going to kill him kill him like like I'm sure he's tired of you know fucking getting dragged up there every day anyway <laughs> so that makes sense to me. Uh, his refusal to yield River Run, that's his family's seat. Like, why is he going to give that up? He's not going to give up River Run. And then the way he scoured the earth and took all the crops and dismissed all the useless mouths from the castle. Well, yeah, you're at war. Like, it's a tough decision, but they have a better chance of keeping River Run because of that decision. I get that some people have grown to not like Brendan Tully and think that he's actually pretty selfish. I, I get it, but would you rather he him like, oh my god, they're, oh, they're about to hang Edmure. Everybody, come on, let's get out of here. Let's go save... Let's, it doesn't matter what they do to us. We're going to save Edmure. Like, yeah. Abandon the castle. We're going to save Edmure. Like, nah, man, come on. We're going backwards. At the time when Hoster attempts to marry him to Bethany Redwine, he's a, he's a catch, Brendan Tully. He's the heir to River Run. He's a knight of courage, uh, known courage throughout the realm and skill, and he is of a great noble house. After his refusal to marry Bethany Rowan, other marriage offers start to get made from the vassal houses of the Tullys, House Bracken, House Frey. And Brendan still chooses to remain unwed. George R. R. Martin, as far as I could see, never really shed light on why Brendan Tully chose to remain unmarried. He kind of keeps it, he kind of keeps it for the only imagination, I guess. Yeah. Going back to what you said before, the popular theory is that Brendan Tully is gay. He would rather marry a dude. But where are people getting this from? Because he didn't want to marry? Mm -hmm. Jamie Lannister didn't want to marry. He wanted to be a knight. You know, there's a, a lot of characters in A Song of Ice and Fire that don't, don't want to deal with the politics of a marriage alliance and getting married. So I, I don't know that that necessarily means that Brendan Tully is gay. But I guess... The way people figured out Renly is gay, I guess you look at the fact that he doesn't get married and the fact that him and Norbert Vance are so close. The only thing with this is it's it's canon, but it's really obscure things to pick out from what you're reading. And ultimately, I don't I don't think it matters whether he's gay or not. His choice to remain unmarried, the strain that it causes is what's important. Mm -hmm. Hoster and Brendan have fights over what Brendan should be doing. Hoster calls him the black goat of the Tully flock. And we know the story, Brendan pointing out the obvious that their sigil was a fish. He would be a black fish instead of a black goat. And from that day on, Brendan took for his personal sigil a variation of the Tully sigil. He took a black trout jumping instead of a silver trout and became known as the blackfish. As per Catelyn POV, she believes herself to be Hoster Tully's favorite child. <laughs> Amma's favorite. Definitely not Lysa. And, and that always seemed to be a big thing between the two sisters, particularly that, you know, like, I'm um, daddy's favorite. You yeah. know, they both think they wanted to clean that, it seems. Yeah. Grow up. It's like Jan and Marsha. It's always Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Edmure would be the favorite if you knew what you fucking idiots did. She offers some examples. When he grew tired, she would read to him in his solar. This is I mean, I don't know, like, how that proves that, that she's his favorite because she read to him. She recalled that her father was often away from home and frequently stayed at the Crossroads Inn. Catelyn and Lysa would sometimes accompany him on his journeys through the region. When they did not, Hoster would tell Catelyn to wait for him at River Run. So, let me ask you, John. I said this before, that Hoster Tully was not the kind of guy that could sit still, and he was always traveling. Why is it that Hoster Tully left River Run to travel so often? Is it possible that he's having an affair? Or do you think all this travel was truly... River Run business that he had to go and, and attend to. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It would be very suspicious in this day and age if, you know, if the father of the household is constantly, right. you know, going out on a Friday night, you right. know, not coming back till, you know, his business. Sunday night or something. It's family business. <laughs> I'll be back. would definitely be raising a couple of red flags. Yeah. But this, in this male dominated society of Westeros, you know, Lady Minis is just like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll be here when you get back. You know, no problem. But she did seem to be a sickly woman, Lady Minissa. And I guess with the death of two sons, 
I, I can understand why he would go and seek comfort elsewhere if that's what he was doing. But again, this is just stuff that's left to our imagination. Run up to Mole's Town every week. Right, yeah. <laughs> that's why him and uh, Rickard Tully, were, Rickard Stark were so uh, known. <laughs> we'll stop at Winterfell for a nice little brew. <laughs> Then up north of Mole's town. Complain about Catelyn and Brandon. That's when they, they're like, hey, we'll marry them to each other. Great idea. Ricard and Hoster. So yeah, Lady Minnesota went, seemed to be a sickly woman. And this idea is argued by the fact that she carried a child six times, but three of them died. There are recollections of Catelyn in her own POVs of her mother being ill. Although Hoster's relationship with Brendan was not in a good way, his children and his ward all greatly enjoyed Brendan's company. When Hoster was busy with River Run business and Lady Minissa was ill, the kids would go to their uncle with their everyday stories and issues. One example is telling to both Brendan's relationship with his nieces, nephew, and brother's ward and to his relationship with his brother. And it's when Catelyn rejected a kiss from Peter Baelish as they're a little bit older. So Peter Baelish drinks himself stupid. She had just been betrothed to Brandon Stark of Winterfell and the news was as upsetting for Peter as it was exciting for Catelyn. So to prevent the Lord of Riverrun from seeing his ward in such a state passed out drunk, Brendan carries the boy away from the table that he had passed on and puts him in bed, hiding the whole thing from, from Hoster. And I think that's a pretty good bridge into Littlefinger because I do want to cover Littlefinger just a smidge before we get going here. The moves, you said it before, the moves that Catelyn makes, the moves that Lysa makes, so many of them are manipulated by Peter Baelish. John, I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure if Peter Baelish is not in your top five least favorite characters, he's definitely in your top ten. Right? He's top five, definitely. He's definitely top five. Okay. Peter Baelish was a short and skinny kid. Short and skinny for a boy his age, but he always seemed very clever. He was a bold child. He got into trouble a lot. His family is, dude. This is this is the issue that I'm I'm having. His family is like. So questionable. His great grandfather was a sellsword from Bravos, who came into the service of a Lord Corbray. This sellsword's son became a hedge knight and took the stone head of the Titan of Bravos as his sigil. Somehow, one way or another, this hedge knight is rewarded a few stone covered acres of land on the smallest of the Finger Islands, and he becomes a very minor lord. This man, also, by the way, unnamed, as is the great grandfather, unnamed, this man during the War of the Nine Penny Kings, befriends Hoster Tully. And they were such good friends that Hoster looks at this guy who is a hedge knight that became like a very minor lord and is like, you know what? I'll raise your son at River Run. So I got to think like this guy must have saved Hoster Tully's life or... Hoster just can't friends with everyone in, the war, in that war. <laughs> Come on! I guess so, man. <laughs> we got beers! <laughs> <laughs> Kegger. We're going Kegger streaking. Totally <laughs> uh, but that's it. They served together in the War of the Nine Penny Kings, which is a war that doesn't even last anywhere close to a year. And all of a sudden he's like, yeah, you know, I'll raise your son in River Run. And, and this minor lord is like, uh, okay, cool. So Peter Baelish is raised along with Hoster's children. Ed Muir gives him the nickname Littlefinger because of his short stature and because of his family's home on the Finger Islands. Mm -hmm. The nickname stuck with him throughout his entire life. And Peter Baelish grew close all of the Tully children. He had accompanied Lord Hoster on at least one journey that he made to Seaguard for River Run business. But as he grew older, Peter Baelish fell in love with Catelyn. Catelyn was several, several years older than him. Peter, being closer in age to Edmure, but I think he's... I, honestly, I think he might be closer in age to Lysa because Peter Baelish actually helps us figure out everybody else's age a bit better because Peter Baelish, we know, was born in 268 AC. Catelyn did not have anywhere near the same feelings for Peter, instead seeing him as a brother. But Lysa, like you said before, she fell in love with Littlefinger. I loved him. Loved him. Uh, dude. Oh, my God. For life. All right. So let's look at the ages again. Because we have a better idea with Peter Baelish. We know it's canon. He was born in 268 AC. He's 30 when A Song of Ice and Fire starts. It does help us figure things out. So Hoster, born between 238 and 240 AC. Brendan Tully, born between 243 and 245 AC. Minissa, born during or before 250 AC. 
She has to have died between 268 and 278 AC, so another 10-year gap. Catelyn, born 264-265. Lysa, born 266-268. Edmure, born 267-274. Peter Baelish, born 268 AC. So here's what I'm thinking, right? A Song of Ice and Fire begins with Game of Thrones, and it begins with Jon Arryn's death. Jon Arryn dies in 298 AC, so it's safe to say that 298 AC is when the events of A Song of Ice and Fire begins. This means that Lady Minissa Went, when Game of Thrones starts, is dead anywhere from 20 to 30 years. Um, Hoster is 58, 60 years old. Brendan Blackfish Tully is 53, 55 years old. Catelyn is anywhere from 33 to 34. Lysa is 30 to 32. Edmure is anywhere from <laughs> 24 to 31. But Littlefinger is 30 years old. And I'm bringing up their ages. I have two points. First is to demonstrate that every Tully of the A Song of Ice and Fire generation of Tullys mm-hmm. is too fucking old to ma- to be making the stupid decisions that they make, right? Because you can look at like Sansa making a decision and be like, oh, you're so stupid, Sansa. But she's also like a fucking teenager. Like, she, like she's right. a kid. At least she's young. Right. Like, dude, like, like Catelyn's like fucking a 33-year-old woman not thinking at all. Yeah, Lysa's a 30-year-old woman not thinking at all. Edmure's, you know, he could be a 24-year-old, 24-year-old dude or like a 30-year-old man. Same thing. Like they're too old for these stupid choices. Um, but the second thing about their ages, and it's harder to put this into words, but there's something about Lady Minnesota Went that it's like grabbing my attention. And no matter how much thought I give to her, I can't figure out what it is that I'm missing with her. But there's a short passage from a Catelyn chapter, and I think it's in A Storm of Swords. But it it makes me want to like take a look at Lady Minissa and House Went. And what she says is, Lady Minissa Tully had died in childbed, trying to give Lord Hoster a second son. The baby had perished with her, and afterward, some of the life had gone out of father. She was always so calm, Catelyn thought, remembering her mother's soft hands, her warm smile. If she had lived, how different our lives might have been. And that passage actually poses an interesting question, either to address or just to keep in mind, you know, as we look at Catelyn, like how different would things have been if Minissa Tully had lived and had given Lord Hoster a second son? How different might Lysa Tully's life have been if a mother had lived? You know, not having a mother and having a father that obviously cared about them, but was traveling around and was always sad because of Minissa Tully's death. It's different than having, especially for, for young ladies, it's different than having a mom around. Um, so Catelyn would have been between... It it says between four and fourteen years old when Lady Minissa passed. But in the passage about her mother, Catelyn recalls her mother being calm, having soft hands and a warm smile. Do you remember? I mean, obviously you remember in Return of the Jedi, right? When Luke says before he tells uh, Leia that she's his sister, he asks her, "You know what? What do you remember of your mother?" And she she answers him. She's like, um. What did she say? Uh, uh, right. He says that she remembers like, like, uh, uh, yeah, right. Right. But then when we, when we see Revenge of the Sith, that she basically gives birth and dies. So how does she have any memory of those images? And I think it's, yeah, I'm not, I'm not knocking Lucas's writing. I'm not knocking anything with it at all, because I think that, I mean, either A, you could chalk it up to force. I mean, you could chalk anything up to the force. But I think that you can kind of create something in your mind for a parent that you lost or or, or something that you lost. You can kind of create a memory or an image that isn't real, that you never had, but it's just something you put in your head. So when Catelyn recalls her mom being calm, having soft hands and a warm smile, when she recalls this, she'd be at 33. So I'm not sure that these recollections would would still be with her if she was four when her mother passed away. So if these memories that Catelyn has of her mother can be trusted, it is more likely that Catelyn was probably something like like 10 or 11 when her mom died, right? Soft hands and a warm smile. It's easy enough to attach 
you know, those qualities to like to anybody. You're like, oh yeah, I guess he had soft hands and a warm smile. Everybody's got a fucking warm smile. And, you know, anybody of noble birth probably has soft hands. You know, so it's not really like a memory. But Catelyn recalls Lady Minissa being calm. So that tells me that Catelyn had to be old enough to understand not just the calm demeanor people have and how that can affect other people close to them. To understand that, she, a four-year-old is not going to comprehend a calm demeanor and how it calms other people down. Um, she also muses on how different their lives might have been. So that tells me that Catelyn has a strong understanding of her mother's personality. And it tells me that she can look back at her life, her family's life, apply how Lady Manissa remaining in their life might have changed things. Frank, my stepson was four when I met him. He doesn't remember shit from when he was four. Mm -hmm. Three years ago, but he doesn't remember shit from when he was four. Catelyn Tolley's noble birth, oldest child of a great house of Westeros. She would have had private education, best education available from one of the best maesters in the realm. Even with that, I can't, I can't see her being I'll say maybe 10, but I would think she's probably more like 12 when her mother dies. Um, but we'll say for argument's sake that Catelyn's 10 when Lady Minissa dies. That would make Lysa between 7 and 9. It would make Edmure between 1 and 8. And it would make the Tully family ward Peter Baelish 7. We don't have any answer in canon in A Song of Ice and Fire. But if we look at the Tullys and we look at them aged this way, it's safe to say that Edmure is likely four years old on the young side, maybe six years on the older side when his mom dies. So he's not one. I think he's more like likely four or five or six when Minissa dies. Mm -hmm. We can reach this conclusion because we know that Peter and Edmure were very close growing up. So if Peter's seven, Edmure's not going to be one, right? We know that Peter's also close in age to Lysa. So Peter Baelish is the constant in this because we know his birth year is 268 mm -hmm. AC. My estimate, my guess is as follows. At the beginning of A Song of Ice and Fire, Hoster is 58, six years old, fine, whatever. I believe Minissa has been dead for 23 years. Catelyn is 33 years old. Lysa is 31 years old. Edmure is 29 years old. And Peter Baelish is 30 years old. Um, what were you going to say, my man? The whole entire like, mother aspect here. Um, yeah. You know, she says how, Catelyn says how much their lives would be different. If their mother had lived, knowing all the yes. things she remembers about her mother, just goes to show you how much of a slime ball she is that she couldn't use <laughs> that she couldn't use that same mentality <laughs> and thinking about John, how John never knew her mother, his mother. Okay, that's that, a good point. That, dude. That, that's, that just that's, proves yeah, how that's much a of point. a swine bag yeah, she is, how much of a hypocritical I, I don't believe anything in her that she says. I don't believe anything that Hosatoli was out there, you know, out there floating about. You know what? I believe Hosatoli was cheating on his wife because I don't believe anything she says. All right? Yeah, okay. She is the constant hag. Constant. Yeah. Consistent. Trapped in her own head. Yeah. You know what's best yeah, for her. Yeah. 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 Kind, of, kind of like a freaking drugged out teen or something. Dude, that's a, that's a good pickup and that's a really good point. Uh, that's why I'm She here. has so... She's... She, <laughs> She has so much dislike and disdain for John for, 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 from and the moment that she met him as a, as a baby. Doesn't look at it like, wow, this kid doesn't even know his mother is. But I, oh God, my, look at this. Oh my God. I need to have a better life. My mom is alive. It's not like, oh, well, I love Ned. Maybe I'll be a mother to, to this child, you know, because the child's important. No, it's not, it's not like that. It's, well, he's, he's not my child. So he's not really a Stark. And I know the argument. John is just, is just reminder that Ned, you know, cheated on her and blah, 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 blah. Well, we talked about Hoster's traveling. So in terms of Lady Manissa, if we want to look at Catelyn as a inaccurate point of view, I guess we could do that. And maybe Hoster was cheating on his wife. It's understandable if he was, because it's the Lord Paramount of Riverlands. He could do whatever the fuck he wants in the Riverlands. I do want to talk about House Went. The most famous member of House Went in A Song of Ice and Fire is probably Sir yeah, Oswald, right? They're the Tower of Joy. That always kind of sticks out. Yeah. The main Went we're looking at is Lady Minnis Went. And there's actually very little to connect her to any members of House Went in terms of where she is in that family tree. So despite House Went being a family and house that seems to stick with probably all the readers in the series, everybody knows House Went and probably maybe relates Littlefinger with Hall, but House Went is the most relatable mm -hmm. to Hall because they have their seed power at Hall when A Song of Ice and Fire starts. And from there, it pretty much goes to Littlefinger much later in the series. 
But despite House Went being one of those minor, minor houses with minor, minor characters that does seem to stick with the reader, there are few members of House Went that hold any sort of fame among the fandom outside of Sir Oswald Went. It's not canon if Lady Manisa and Sir Oswald are from the same branch of House Went. House Went is a noble house in the Riverlands. Their seat is Harren Hall, which is the largest seat in the realm. We know it's built by Harren the Black 300 years before the events of Song of Ice and Fire. The sigil of House Went is nine black bats on a yellow field. And the Wents are the seventh in a long line of noble houses to call Harren Hall their seat of power. And I thought this was kind of amusing. So just for shits and giggles, after Harren of House Hor was burned alive along with his sons, Aegon Targaryen gave Harren Hall and its incomes to Quentin Coheres, who was the master of arms at Dragonstone and also of Valyrian descent. Mm -hmm. House Coheres held Harren Hall for about 36 years. Lord Quentin was succeeded by his grandson, Lord Gargan Coheres. Lord Gargan was murdered, along with the rest of the castle, by Harren the Red, who was an outlaw claiming to be Harren the Black's grandson. For whatever reason, the Targaryens then give Harren Hall to Lucas Harrowet after the extinction after the extinction of uh, House Coheres, and Lord Lucas went on to serve as hand to the king and his daughter Elise Harrowet. She would become Prince Magor's second wife, as in second in Valyrian fashion, as in the first one's alive and well. This dude's got two wives at one time. This is uh, the American Tolkien George R. R. Martin. He writes about this in the Sons of the Dragon, which was part of a collection of novellas put together by Gardner Dubois, definitely not put together by George R. R. Martin. Long story short, Elise Haraway gives birth to Magor's child, but the child was monstrous in appearance. And this pisses off Magor. And this is Magor the Cruel we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So it leads him to wiping out, just because the baby was monstrous, he wipes out every Haraway he can find. His wife, his former hand, every Haraway everywhere kills them all. And he throws a contest to decide the next ruler of Harrenhal. 23 knights battle to the death in Lord Haraway's town. Gotta love it. That's fucking awesome, right? That's, that's. Baker's <laughs> like, what, 23 knights? Fucking whoever was at the best will be the only one left standing. So the winner is Sir Walton Towers, and he's named the Lord of Harrenhal. Simple as that. I think he dies shortly later of his wounds, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> House, ta- uh, House Towers barely lasts two generations before petering out. Sir Lionel Strong is then granted Harrenhal by King Jaehaerys I Targaryen. House Strong sat in Harrenhal until the Dance of the Dragons. Sure, can I get a time out here right now? <laughs> I gotta laugh. I'm sorry. I'm gonna hold it in. What do you got? A, you got a brand meme? <laughs> no, it's a meme. It's a, it's a Star Wars meme. <laughs> I've been laughing in the background for like two minutes. I had to get it out. <laughs> what, 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 what is it? <laughs> it's a picture. Of, it says when you go to, when when you get to work blitzed and have to head straight into an unexpected meeting, and it's a picture of Darth Vader leading all like the human um, commanders in like, the, the brown suits, and then next to one of them is Big Bird. <laughs> <laughs> Share it now on Facebook. It's so funny. I like the one that Pat put in the uh, group text today. Did you see that one? No, I don't know which one. I didn't see that one. Oh, it was, just, it was Vader. And, <laughs> it was, I gotta turn this off. It was Vader and Luke from uh, Return of the Jedi. When oh, the Luke mustard? Goes, the mustard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pretty good one. Uh, oh, sorry about that. I was just trying no, something. No, I right. saw that. I'm like, I, just, I was just laughing. I'm like, let me get it out of my system right now. Prequel memes, sequel memes, you know. Brand <laughs> and, memes. and brand memes. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> all right, Sir Lionel Strong was granted Harren Hall by King Jaehaerys I Targaryen. How strong set tight in Harren Hall until the dance of the dragons. <laughs> I got to see this now. Hold on. Did you post it? You put it on Facebook? I put it on Facebook. All right. <laughs> it's going to be funny when you see it than me talking about it. <laughs> uh, I just gotta go to you. I can't find that.
Oh, dude, the way you made it sound, I thought like it, it was making like Darth Vader look like he was fucking blitzed. But it's <laughs> oh, that's fucking great. That's great. Oh my god, that's fucking awesome. <laughs> oh, that's a beautiful meme. But that's that's like that's like what memes are all about. Yeah, you know, that's fucking great. That is great. <laughs> Uh, all right. Um, how's that? Sir Lionel Strong's granted Harren Hall by King Jerry's one Targaryen. How Strong sat tight until the Dance of Dragons. It was rumored that Sir Harwin Strong, Lionel's son, was the true father to Princess Rhaenyra's Targaryen's three children. This was never proven or disproven. Lord Lionel and his heir, Sir Harwin, both died in a fire at Harren Hall. Lionel's younger son, Larry's Strong, Succeeded as Lord of Harrenhal and sat on King Aegon II's small council. Things got complicated for Lord Larys, and the end of the Dance with the Dragons had him accused of poisoning his king, and he chose death over the wall. Lord Larys Strong was executed by Lord Cregan Stark, who was actually the hand to the king for Aegon III Targaryen, uh, thus ending the main branch of House Strong and their rule in Harrenhal. Due to some drama between Prince Viserys and his son, Prince Aegon, King Aegon III was convinced to name Sir Lucas Lothson, the master at arms at the Red Keep, as the Lord of Harrenhal, after marrying Felina Stokerth. Felina Stokerth, being a noble girl, Viserys Targaryen caught his son Aegon in bed with. So to save, I guess, embarrassment, he has Felina Stokerth marry Sir Lucas Lothson, the master at arms of the Red Keep, and as a reward, he gets Harrenhal. And this is Aegon Unworthy, Aegon IV. So during the rule of King Aegon IV Targaryen, the same Aegon who was caught in bed with Felina Stokerth as a prince, the daughter of Felina Stokerth and Lord Lucas Lawson, became one of Aegon's mistresses. So he, he banged the mom and then he bangs the daughter as king. Foul, um, basically, Great guy. Yeah, Aegon the Unworthy. Uh, basically, he was caught in bed with Felina Stokerth. His father married Felina Stokerth to Lucas Lawson to get her away from court. And when he became king, he took the daughter of that couple to bed. And following that, the Lawsons, it's real sketchy. They do, it's just said that they do dirty deeds. And it culminates with the Lady Danelle Lawson using black arts and magic to cause chaos. Whatever that means, how Lawson was exterminated and Harren Hall is then given finally to House Went, who were bannermen to the Lawsons, but turned on them to help destroy them. And that's really the entirety of the canon of Harrenhal and House Went. The members of House Went that we know are Sir Oswald Went of the Kingsguard, Lord Walter Went, who hosted the tourney of Harrenhal in 281 AC. He was the brother to Sir Oswald Went. Mm -hmm. Lady Shella Went, S-H-E-L-L-A Went, and that was Lord Walter's wife. And according to Catelyn's POV, Lady Shella is the last of her line allowing Harrenhal to fall to ruin while using only the lower thirds of two of Harrenhal's five towers. There's also a Lady Winifrey Went, and she married Sir Danwell Frey, the ninth son of Lord Walder. There's a Lady Saria Went, and she was the fifth wife of Lord Walder Frey. And then we have Lady Manisa. It's probably important to note Lady Winifrey and Lady Saria, who married the Freys, they were unsuccessful in having any children. Lady Manissa lost three children and died during childbirth. So it's possible that the women of House Went as a whole have difficulty birthing children. However, Lady Shella, who had been married to Lord Walter Went, gave birth to four sons and a daughter. And the daughter was the reigning queen of love and beauty at the tourney of Harrenhal. It was believed that Lady Shella was only a Went by marriage, and that's why she birthed five children. But later in the Song of Ice and Fire, it's noted that a character, a minor character, had smithied for Lady Went and her father before her and his father before him at Harrenhal. So this implies that Shella Went was not a Went by marriage. She was actually a Went by birth. It also implies then that Lord Walter Went was Lord by marriage and must have been Lady Shella's cousin, most likely. Either way, the four sons that Lord Walter and Lady Shella have, they're all dead by 298 AC. Very little to no light can be shown on the cause of deaths, but I guess you could assume that they died during Robert's Rebellion or Robert's Rebellion played some part in their death. Uh, in addition to the four unnamed sons, the unnamed daughter, who was the queen of love and beauty, she was also dead by 298 AC. 
So thus and so, it's noted by Catelyn Stark in her pa- uh, in her point of view chapter that Lady Shella is the last of her line, the last of the Wents. But Catelyn does not make any connection to Lady Shella being her grandmother or her aunt or any sort of in-law, even though her mother is a Went. So it's likely that Catelyn's mother, Lady Minissa, is not from the main branch of House Went. Lady Shella goes, uh, she actually goes on to abandon Harrenhal as the War of the Five Kings breaks out. Lord Tywin Lannister and his western host approach the castle, and she fucking splits. It's later implied, I believe Feast for Crows, it's implied that Lady Shella is dead. But in A Dance with Dragons, Lady Shella is alluded to as the dispossessed Lady of Harrenhal. So maybe she is alive. It doesn't fucking matter. It's an old lady, and she's the last of the Wents. Basically, looking at things logically, Minissa Went must have died in the year 276 AC. Catelyn Tully, it makes sense, but I thought it was interesting. Catelyn Tully is 12 years old when she is betrothed to Brandon Stark, which isn't unusual, right? No, back then, no. I think maybe just picturing Catelyn as a 12-year-old puts a bad taste in my mouth. Like, I just, it's like, ugh. Do your feelings about Catelyn, do they change at all knowing that she was a 12-year-old girl when she was betrothed to Brandon Stark? Not at all. Just that she wanted that. She's just like Sansa to Rayro for me. She was so happy. You know, Brandon Stark, Edward Fell. This is great. Um, going through the canon of House Went, I still can't figure out why Lady Manisa is piquing my curiosity so much. Maybe it's a combination of her identity doesn't really make any fucking sense. And maybe that's all it is. Maybe it's just George R. R. Martin's bad, his mistake. But I think it is important to consider Catelyn Stark with as much knowledge of her mother as possible. She's not a member of the main branch of House Went, Minissa Went. No immediate relation to the Wents of Harrenhal. And this is kind of odd, because Hoster Tully at the time is the heir to River Run, the ruling seat of the Riverlands, and therefore the overlords to House Went of Harrenhal. And he marries Minissa. So it'd be like if Robert Baratheon, he chooses to marry a Lannister of Lannisport instead of Cersei Lannister of Casterly Rock. Right? Minnesota went, it's like she's she's from a second or third tier went family. So I think if all this is accurate, I guess Hoster Tully did marry for love and not duty. If he married for duty, especially considering his future actions with his brother Brendan and the betrothal of his daughters to great houses, if he was gonna marry for duty, I would think he would marry like a main branch went or a Bracken, a Blackwood, a Vance, a Piper. Even a Frey. Like, I think he would even marry a Frey before marrying a second tier Went. A May Carter. Yeah, that doesn't help River Run to marry a Went that doesn't live at Harrenhal. Doesn't help you. But he doesn't practice what he preaches, just kind of right. how Catelyn doesn't practice what she preaches. It's very telling. I'm going to get upset. I'm going to get upset at the Blackfish, but pretty much I just, and I, I don't know what, you know. Yeah, the Blackfish is like, dude, you fucking married this, like, how do you even know she's a Went? <laughs> she's got no family, you know? <laughs> And you're telling me I got to marry a fucking chick from uh, the Arbor. So yeah, if Hoster Tully married for love, which it seems as though he did, kind of makes him pot calling the kettle black. He marries for love, but he wants his brother and his daughters to marry for politics. Uh, Catelyn recalls the calming presence her mother exhibited. Does this imply that Hoster Tully was not so calm? So maybe he wasn't. Some of Hoster's behaviors, some of his decisions that are a tad bit spontaneous, not very well thought out. We said he had difficulty sitting still and we often go traveling. If the lands he is responsible for are in order and he wants to enjoy the open road, who's to stop him? He is the Lord Paramount of the Riverlands. If he needs to travel around his lands to keep things in order, that's his duty. It does seem like he got bored a lot, remaining in one place. And this is the real reason he travels so much. It's also possible he had a mistress or a few mistresses throughout the Riverlands. And this is also kind of spontaneous behavior. Not a lot of foresight behavior for the Lord Paramount. He went and arranged a marriage for his brother with House Redwine, a powerful noble house with wealth and at times the strongest naval might in Westeros. He did not get his brother's thoughts, feelings, or permission before arranging this marriage. That's kind of spontaneous. He took to ward the son of a really minor lord of a really shitty island because they got on pretty well while they fought in a war together. And as it happens, the really minor lord of a really shitty island was himself a hedge knight who was rewarded a really shitty island and his father was a sellsword from across the narrow sea. The ward Hoster Tully took on would go on to manipulate both his daughters and indirectly bring about the fall of House Tully. And House Stark. And House Stark. He seemed to have spent his time teaching Catelyn to rule more so than Edmure. 
At least that's what I get from the readings. Granted, Catelyn is at least three or four years older than Edmure, and Hoster had two sons before Catelyn that did not survive infancy. But compared to the way Edmure is treated throughout the first act of A Song of Ice and Fire, at least, it looks as though Catelyn was groomed for rule in more ways than Hoster's actual heir. I don't know if you agree or disagree with that, but would you say that Catelyn seems more confident in rule, more ready to make the decision than Edmure? I'm going to answer this in two ways that I can. Okay. I would say yes. Actually, this is going to be a three. This is going to be a three part. All right. Yes. Broke it down into two ways why that'd be a yes. One, Emir is a total fool. Two, just like everything Catelyn does, she thinks she knows everything. She thinks she knows she knows how to rule. Oh, bro, she knows she knows everything. Miss know it all. So it's a yes, but there's reasons behind that yes. So, what degree of responsibility for the Catelyn Edmure dynamic do you put on? Hoster Tully. Well, well, what do you forget about even Edmure? Just looking at Catelyn, her behavior. How much do you blame strictly on Catelyn, and how much do you blame on Hoster in the way that he raised Catelyn, almost as his heir? You know, until Edmure was born, at least. Right. Make him false. What's the wrong one for a false? Uh, uh, like a false sense of, of power. Expectations. Yeah. Right. False sense of expectations. False sense of uh, like obligation of like you are the heir, Catelyn. Yeah. Catelyn's like, well, I'm the heir. My dad raised me, you know, I'm, I'm right, the heir. You were going to do this to say you do this? Yeah. Hold on. Hoster, you have a boy. He's alive. All right. Go play the sister. Yeah. We have the heir right now. He's born. So despite being groomed for rule and treated as a son in some ways and considered Hoster's favorite child, Catelyn, as we well know and will discuss, goes on to make some whammy fucking decisions once she gets, like, the slightest, like, whiff of power. Yeah. It's done. The slightest bit of control. Lysa is also not so good with decision making, though her poor decisions yeah. appear earlier than Catelyn's as she falls in love with Peter Baelish and allows him to get her pregnant. The way Hoster deals with Peter Baelish, which we will take a, a better look at, does, I mean, at least 2020 hindsight, it seems to have not been such a good idea, considering how things stand for House Tully at the end of, at least at the end of A Feast for Crows, Hoster probably should have punished Peter Baelish more severely for impregnating his one daughter and nearly, and nearly ruining right. the marriage alliance right. made using the other. I feel like most lords would look at the trouble that he caused. You, you, you would think. Punish him, like, end his life or, or something like that. But Send him to the wall. Would that be a possibility? Would, would that be, would you, I'm sure a guy who has to tell you, but you go on the wall, you're going to die. I mean, you're, you're, you're committing. Well, I mean, like. You're, you're trying to commit a. Like, what would the repercussions be if Hasta Tully was like, you know what, Peter, I'm just going to fucking cut your head off. And he cuts his head off. Like, what kind of repercussions could there possibly be? Like, like is House Baelish going to rise and revolt? Right, right. This is like charity taking him on. And then he's he's very, very light with the punishment. Right. Well, it's like he was a member from House Frey. He killed a member from House Frey. Then all of a sudden, maybe, you know, right. how many people are a part of you in House Baelish or even support House, yeah. House Baelish? No, nobody. Those are just the ones I thought off the top of my head, the behaviors of Hoster Tully that can seem spontaneous or not so much spontaneous, but not well thought out. Not a whole lot of foresight in those decisions. So how do they relate to Minissa Tully? Maybe they don't. Maybe the reason that Hoster loved his wife is because he had like attention deficit disorder and he couldn't sit still. He couldn't think through a decision, but the calming presence of Minissa Went helped walk him through the thought process needed to rule the Riverlands. So with that in mind, is it possible that Lady Minissa had input into Hoster's decisions for the marriage alliance with the Red Wines, for later on for the marriage alliance with the Starks? Is it possible that Minissa went was the brains of the operation? It's tough. I would, yeah, I would give it, yeah. I still want to look, think that Hoster Tully is the wise ruler right. we thought he's, he was right. going over Robert's Rebellion. The foresight. I still see him as that. Though going through behaviors we just talked about, it doesn't seem like it's the same guy. It's just one of those things I like to put in every character well, to, to question well, the motives. This is what I'm finding with House Tully. All anger and, and frustration at Catelyn Tully aside, it seems like House Tully in general is a lot of contradiction. Hoster's got incredible foresight, and he doesn't. Even their whole entire words are, are a contradiction to what they actually do. Failing duty honor. What kind of freaking honor they have when they just, they turn on their own thing and family for crying out loud. Rob, uh, you know, Callan turned on Rob by releasing Jamie. That, to me, I'll never let that go. 
I always harp on that. Catelyn releasing Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen. When we when we get into her narrative <laughs> proper, it's, which we're coming up on, but there's a scale for each decision she makes. You know, the repercussions that happen, I guess, that makes that decision worse or better. But pretty much every decision she made is is catastrophic. And you don't want to think that mm-hmm. Hoster Tully, you know, the guy that pretty much – I mean, he, he didn't save Robert's cause. He didn't save House Stark. But if he didn't stick by that marriage pact, you know, we know that the war of the usurper would have been a lot different. But that guy's daughter then – undoes all of the good that he did more so. I don't want to think that this guy we thought was wise has a daughter that is like the complete opposite. You, you definitely see traits of him and yeah. her and so you definitely have to come back to the possibility that he's just as much of a dungle brock than she, that as she is. You know, looking at it, I, I, honestly, and I knew, I knew I would and we'll talk more about it later on, but I look at the way Catelyn acts and then looking at her relationship with her father and how her father was. It reminds me so much of Cersei Lannister, the way she acts and her relationship with her father. I think Catelyn's relationship was better, but they both learned from their father or were confident that they had learned everything they could from their father and it wasn't the case for either one. And they thought that they were mimicking their father. They thought they were making the same wise decisions that their father would have made. In actuality, they were making decisions that their father would never have made. All right, the succession of House Tully, we don't know the name of Hoster's father. We don't know if Hoster had any siblings other than Brendan. We do know that Hoster Tully succeeded his father as Lord Paramount of the Trident. His heir was his brother Brendan, who seemed more interested in fighting and adventuring than ruling. Brendan would have been Hoster's heir by the laws of Westeros, and these are laws that House Tully helped to establish during the Great Council of 101 AC. Brendan would have been the heir for at least five years. However, Hoster and Brendan had their falling out over the Bethany Redwine marriage early on in Hoster's rule at River Run. So let's say for argument's sake that for three to four years of ruling River Run, Hoster had a bad relationship with his heir and he had no son to succeed him, not to mention he witnessed the death of two sons as infants during that time. With two sons not surviving infancy, anger at his heir, who was likely gay, had Hoster died and Brenda became the Lord of River Run, it could have very well meant the end of the Tully line. So is it really any wonder that Hoster took such a great interest in raising Catelyn as though she was his heir? That makes sense, right? Yeah, especially with the fact that, you know, you know how his wife is going to be able to, you know, produce anything, you know, at that point. If it's not going to be Catelyn, then my, my brother is not even going against my, is, is going against my wishes on a simple thing of marriage. Why should I even yeah. trust him? That'd be it for the Tullys. It's like Stannis with Shireen. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to have my daughter marry. Stark, that'll twofold yeah. everything. I'm sure. I'm sure this was birthed from from that. The the idea of marrying another great house was birthed from his worry at having no heir. His worry for House Tully. So that being said, let's stop there for today. And when we come back with this, pretty much be in a song of ice and fire, and just following Catelyn. Well, with the exception of stuff with Littlefinger and you know his duel with Brandon, which we should probably touch on. That's really all the backstory you need for Catelyn. And I don't think anything that we've talked about makes us more sympathetic to her, unless it's changed things for you, John. Just knowing that, like, Lady Minis is... <laughs> nothing, nothing, will, no, nothing, nothing. <laughs> nothing will ever change. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, you know, I didn't think it was gonna, but I did my best to try and find, like, some sort of, like, information about her that would make us look at her and be like, you know what, I now I understand why she does what she does. But there is no such information. Anyway. All right, so we'll be back next time picking up with her betrothal to Brandon Stark and Brandon Stark's duel with Littlefinger. Thanks for listening. You can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash The Promise Princes. Follow us on Twitter at Princes Promise. Find us on Tumblr also, Instagram. Read the Westerosi Companion, the princes that were promised.com. Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, Stitcher, SoundCloud. We're on YouTube now. You can listen to our podcasts. Leave a review, subscribe. Tell a friend about the princes that were promised. Thank you for listening, and we will speak with you guys later. Bum, 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 bum,